So Jesus uses different images when he preaches and when he teaches. Uh, Sometimes he talks about sheep and shepherds. I have to admit, I don't know a lot about sheep and shepherds. Not really something I grew up with. But when he talks about vines and vineyards, I get that, right? Like I come from a family, a a legacy of of farmers. My grandfather grew grapes since like the, I mean, the early 1900s. And so I remember going out with my grandfather when we were growing up as kids and driving out to the vineyards with my grandfather and listening to him talk. Now this, of course, was in the days before car seats, when you just sat in the front row of a pickup truck as a six or seven year old and thought nothing of it, right? My grandfather, some of you may have had this car. They were called, it was the Ranchero. Do you remember that? Like it was the El Camino was like the other version of it, but it was like the, the station wagon with the, the top cut off. And so for a number of years, he drove that. But I remember fondly going out to the vineyards with my grandfather, going to his vineyards, but also just listening in on the conversation he would have with either my brother or me, or with, depending if we were all together. And he would talk about the different vineyards as we drove by them. He would talk about how you could tell if someone was farming well or not farming well. We would go out and we would walk through the vineyards. And, and he would talk about things like the sugar content of the grapes. He would talk about whether he was going to make wine that year or make raisins. And, and, and kind of instructing and teaching and showing my brother and me both about what does it mean to be a good farmer? But what does it ultimately mean to have vines that produce a rich harvest, that produce appropriate grapes? And I remember years and years and years ago when I was preaching on this text, this is probably 20 years ago or so, it was quite a while ago, and talking to him about the text that we're going to be looking at, which Jesus is the vine and we are the branches, and him saying something to me that, that, that's, that stuck with me. And he said, what you have to remember is that a vine does not immediately produce grapes. It takes time. And for me, that's kind of been a formational thing of thinking through how is it that we grow in Jesus It doesn't just happen immediately. We don't just instantly start producing this incredible fruit, but it is a process. And so in this sermon series for the past several weeks, we've been talking about this idea of how is it that God forms us? What does it mean to not just be made in the image of Christ, but also to be shaped and formed by the living God? And I want to suggest to us that in order for that to happen, it takes time. You know, we all want it instantly. I I mean, I would love to have instant spiritual growth, instant, you know, 100% discipleship, all that sort of stuff. Uh, But I'm old enough to know now that, that it doesn't happen instantly. But it is a process, and it takes time. So in our story this morning, Jesus tells, speaks of himself as the vine. We're in the Gospel of John, and if you know something about the Gospel of John, you'll know that Jesus has these seven I am statements within the Gospel of John that are very important, that that, that the Greek language is ego, a me, which means I am, but he begins his statements with this phrase, I am, and that I am language is hugely important, And if you remember last week, which you may or may not remember last week, because I barely remember last week, someone was talking to me the other day about the sermon I preached last Sunday, and I was like, what was that sermon last Sunday? Man, who did I talk about last Sunday? Uh, I talked about Andrew, if you remember that, who went and got his brother Simon Peter. But within the context of that sermon, I I quoted from Exodus chapter 3, when Moses, go, when Moses is approached by God to go and begin liberating the people, and Moses is concerned about, well, who do I tell them that sent me? Because he knows if he goes, the Israelites are going to be like, well, you've been away from this group for 40 years. What do you know about us? All this sort of stuff. And do you remember what God says? God says, tell them, I am has sent you. I am who I am. I will be who I will be. But it's just this phrase, I am. So when Jesus starts using that language, 
people start paying attention. You and I, we might miss it because we might not know that connection back to this, the, the statement in Exodus chapter three. But when Jesus says, I am, I'm the resurrection of life. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. I am the good shepherd. He's saying, I am God. And of course, the relig- religious leaders really don't like that. But we're gonna look at one of those I am statements. It's actually the last I am statement in the gospel of John. John chapter 15, verses one through eight. This is what we read. This is Jesus speaking. I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more faithful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. Do you remain in me and my words remain in you? Ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Jesus says there's something about the bearing of fruit. As we bear fruit, it reveals the glory of God. And I love that God wants us to be a part of his story. Back to the vine. The vine was an important symbol in Old Testament history. We read, and you may recall, when when Moses sends the spies into the land of Canaan to explore the land, and they come back saying the land is occupied with giants, right? But they also come back carrying a cluster of grapes, right? that is so big they had to put it on a pole and that two people had to carry it. So even in the story of of, of the Pentateuch, we're beginning to see the formation of saying the vine is important. Time after time after time, Israel will be referred to as the vine. But as you get into Ezekiel and you get into Jeremiah, you discover there is an issue. This vine is corrupt. This vine is not producing fruit. This vine is withering up, and it's fit to be burned. And so something has to happen. And so when Jesus comes along and says, I am the vine, he is saying, I am taking the place of the people of Israel. What God intended with the people of Israel, which if you recall, their job, their task, was to, was to point the people to the glory of God. This was what the nation of Israel was to be about. They were a set-apart people testifying to the goodness of God's grace, and they messed it up. And so the image of the vine is often in the Old Testament seen as an image of judgment. So what we're gonna do, because I think it's always good to kind of This is why Old Testament, I tell you, Old Testament matters, Old Testament matters, Old Testament matters, Hebrew scriptures matter, because in those, we're beginning to be formed and shaped for what it is that we're going to find when we encounter Jesus. So we're going to take a look back at Psalm 80, because it speaks of this vine, and it speaks of what's going to happen, but first of all, it speaks of how it is related to Israel. So this is Psalm chapter 80, verse 8. The psalmist looks back. God, you transplanted a vine from Egypt. Okay, so this is speaking about the Exodus, right? You transplanted a vine from Egypt. You drove out the nations and planted it. You cleared the ground for it, and it took root and filled the land. The mountains were covered with its shade, the mighty cedars with its branches. Its branches reached as far as the sea, its shoots as far as the river. This is describing Israel. This is describing their arrival in the promised land. And the image is one of the vine, this vine that grows 
and produces fruit. And you think about the story of once Israel gets to the promised land and the blessing that God gives to Israel, and don't we all want to live there? But then something happens, continuing on. Verse 12, why, God, have you broken down its walls so that all who pass by pick its grapes? Boars from the forest ravage it, and insects from the fields feed on it. Return to us, God Almighty, look down from heaven and see. Watch over this vine, and then I love this, the root your right hand has planted, the sun you have raised up for yourself. You see what's happening here? Israel is now paying the price for being unfaithful. They're being invaded by the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Persians. There is a cost to their lack of faithfulness. But in, even in the midst of this psalm, as this is being described, the psalmist looks and says, but you know what? There is a son that you have raised up. Then we keep reading, verse 16. Your vine is cut down. It is burned with fire. At your rebuke, your people perish. And then this, let your right hand rest on the man at your right hand. Or let your hand rest on the man at your right hand. The son of man, do you see this? Okay, I, I see nobody. Is this not amazing? I, I, I'm just gonna stop and park for a few minutes on this, okay? I mean, is this not amazing that you're reading right through Psalm 80 and all of a sudden it's talking about the son of man who sits at the right-hand side of the father that's going to be raised up? Like, so when Israel starts hearing that Jesus is saying, I am the vine, they are all of a sudden saying, well, this is the one that's being talked about in Psalm 80, and there's no way that this guy born out in the boondocks in Bethlehem could ever be the Messiah, because if you were going to be the Messiah, you would have come out of Jerusalem, you would have come out of somewhere famous, you would be blowing the Romans apart, you would be bringing peace to the land. Y'all with me? I got a little passionate there, okay? I just want to make sure we're, we're tracking along here. I mean, it's phenomenal that you're reading through this psalm and all of a sudden we're reading about Jesus. And then as we continue on, okay, let your hand rest on the man at your right side, the son of man you have raised up for yourself, verse 18. Then we will not turn away from you. Revive us and we will call on your name. Jesus said, as the text we looked at last week, I'm the living water. He brings revival. He brings renewal. And so when Jesus comes along and says, I am the vine and you are the branches, we point back to Psalm 80. We point back to Isaiah 27, which we're not going to read this morning, but you can look there as well. And then I love this refrain. I love when the Psalms have refrains because they don't always do it, but certain Psalms have a certain refrain that appears once or twice or three times throughout the Psalm. And Psalm 80 is one of those. And this is the last verse, third time it's used. Restore us, Lord God Almighty. Make your face shine on us that we may be saved. Restore us, God. Renew us, God. Revive us, God. This is the prayer of the people. This is the song that they sang that pointed to the one who is coming, the one who sits at the right hand, the Son of Man. So when I say the Old Testament is important, this is why it's important. Because we're seeing the foreshadowing of the arrival of Jesus. So Jesus comes along and he says, hey, you know what? I'm not just the vine. I'm the true vine. I'm the real vine. And you want to watch religious leaders just grow furious. This is when it happens. Because he's saying, I am, I am taking... This is bad. I mean, it's good, but it's bad for the religious leaders of Israel. He says, do you know what I'm doing? I'm taking your place. Because God set you up. Well, God, first of all, started with Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve, right? They kind of didn't do very well with their job description. God then said, okay, I'm going to bring along a nation, the nation of Israel, who's supposed to do the same thing that Adam and Eve did, which was to point to God's goodness and glory and to reveal God's glory to creation. Israel didn't do a very good job of that. They didn't care for the poor. They didn't care for the widow. They didn't care for the orphan. And so God finally says, look, I know you all can't do this. So I'm sending my son. And Jesus says, I'm the real vine. I'm the true vine. 
and I am going to take the place of Israel because I will show others how to love. I will show others what mercy looks like. I will be the light of the world. And of course, the religious leaders hear this and they scowl. But Jesus says, if you remain in me, you will bear much fruit. If you make your home in me, your life will be forever changed. And so there's this invitation of Jesus this abiding, and we're talking a little bit more about this in just a moment, but there's this invitation that says, come and be with me. All you who are weary, come. All you who are heavy burden, come, and you will find rest. Many of you know that I uh, went to seminary in New Jersey at Princeton, and um, I was a West Coast kid and moving to the East Coast, and uh, I don't know if you've noticed this or not, but things are different in California than in New Jersey. It was a little, little kind of a duh, right? Like, hey, people are, they're not quite as nice in New Jersey. They move a little faster than we do in California. Um, but the gift God had for me was my dad, one of my dad's sisters lived in, lived in Manhattan on the Upper West Side. Now, my Aunt Sarah was beloved, and she never had kids, never married. She left her small little West Tennessee town when she was 19 years old never looked back and moved straight to New York City and lived there for 40 or 50 years. Now, my Aunt Sarah was awesome in many ways, but what I loved about her was that she would, this was back when you actually had to pick up a phone, right? Didn't have it in your back pocket, didn't have texting, uh, and she would call me. And she would, if I wasn't there in my dorm, she'd leave me a voicemail, right? Like on those machines that we used to have. Y'all, some of you probably still have these machines, right? Um, And she would say, hey, Paul, I know school's tough. I know you're in a new place. Why don't you come and stay the weekend with me? Why don't you take the train up and we'll just hang out? And it was a gift because what she was saying was this, come and be at home with me. And she would spoil me, which was awesome, right? Like food. Now, my aunt never cooked a meal in her life, although we did try to cook Thanksgiving dinner once. That's a whole different story that I don't have time for. But she would take me out to eat. She would take me to Broadway shows. We would talk and converse. And she was um, like, there's like progressives and super progressives, right? And she was to the left of that. So it was always just great to have like these theological conversations and political conversations and to know that no matter what I said and no matter what she said, we, were, we both loved each other. That wasn't the issue. Was, but I love the fact that she said, hey, come and be with me. Let me renew, she didn't use this language, but it was this language. Let me renew your soul. Come and be at home. And when I think about what Jesus is saying when he says, I'm the vine and you are the branches, let me abide in you. This is one of the images that comes to me of him saying, I am creating a safe place for you. And there is this sense, in particularly in the Gospel of John, of interabiding. And we see this. I just want to read a couple of verses just to kind of make this clear. John 14, verse 10, as Jesus is speaking. He says, don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. If you were a religious leader, this would have driven you nuts. But Jesus is saying, I am in the Father and the Father is in me. We abide together. And then we move down a couple of verses to John chapter 14, verse 17, as Jesus talks about the advocate that he is going to give to the disciples. And we read this, speaking of the spirit of truth. It says, the world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him for the spirit. He lives with you and will be 
in you, abiding. Promise, it's the language of promise. Jesus says, I have to go to the Father, but I will send one who will abide with you. And then we get towards the very end of the scriptures in Revelation chapter three, a text that we probably know because we've heard it used in different occasions. But I love the image that we are given by the author of Revelation. This is verse, or chapter three, verse 20. Jesus speaking to the church. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. Again, language of abiding, language of remaining, language of a home, a safe place. And what Jesus is continually trying to get at is saying, make your home with me. The language of vine and vineyards, abide in me. The branch has to be in the vine. Revelation chapter three, hey, I wanna come in and share a meal with you. I just want to be with you. So in order to be formed, and next week we're gonna start talking about, okay, if we have been being formed, what does that mean? And what do we, how do we move from being formed, right, to doing, because that's partially where we all always want to get to. But in order to be formed by Jesus, we have to be with him. It's the only way it works. And sometimes, unfortunately, that involves pruning, right? Because the image that Jesus uses here. Now, I will tell you about my grandfather. When I was at the vineyard, I could do anything I wanted, well, almost anything I wanted, except for one thing. He never let me prune the vines. I went out to the ranch and tied down vines after they were pruned. I learned how to take the sharp little knife and cut the the bunches of of grapes I got to ride the four-wheeler, which was always the best. Of course, back then it was a three-wheeler. That was always the best thing, or the motorbike. That was always awesome. But I never got to prune the vines because he knew something. And what was that? I'd mess it up. I'd get too hasty. I just want to be done and get paid, right? And he was like, I don't trust you. He didn't say that. He wasn't, that quite, he wasn't quite that direct, but it was very clear. You don't cut the vines. You don't do the pruning. We bring in experts to do that. And so when I think about how God forms us and shapes us and God prunes us, I'm grateful that he is the master gardener because he knows just how we need to be formed and just how we need to be shaped and where and when it is that we need to be pruned, and when life comes along and prunes us in a way that we are not expecting it, God comes along and says, I'm still with you. But it is key that we remain with God if we're to be formed by him. And there's something else to this as well of why it's important to stay with Jesus, because in our lives, I think there are things that Jesus, well, I know there are things that Jesus wants to teach us. But sometimes we're not ready to hear his truth. Sometimes we're not ready for the lesson. And that's why Jesus says, you have to spend some time with me. You need to abide in me. So the bottom line is this, we all bear fruit. The issue is, what kind of fruit do we bear? Luke chapter 6, verse 43 to 45. This is uh, what is sometimes called uh, the Sermon on the Plain. Matthew has the Sermon on the Mount, the mountaintop. Luke has the Sermon on the Plain, the crowds gathered. And Jesus is talking about a tree now instead of a vine and its fruit. And he says this, no good tree bears bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. 
Each tree is recognized by its own fruit. People do not pick figs from thorn bushes or grapes from briars. And then this line. A good person brings good things out of the good stored up in their heart. And an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth, and this is the line, the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. The proverb talks about out of the overflow of the heart, a person speaks. But Jesus' words, is the, or words are these. The mouth speaks what the heart is full of. And the heart for, for Jesus, I mean, it's a little bit different than what we would think of, but, it, but it's basically this idea of where are our values formed, where are our attitudes formed. We speak out of whatever it is that fills our heart. And we can fool people because if we're not around people all the time, guess what? We can fool them. But if you stick with someone long enough, you begin to see what their heart is truly like. And Jesus, being Jesus, when he says this, he's looking right at the religious leaders and saying, you know what? You follow all the rules. You check all the boxes. You've got 613 of the commandments all figured out. You, you read your scripture. You go to temple. You take the Sabbath. But you don't love your neighbor. He says, there's nothing transformational happening in your life. And the inference is this. They're not bearing good fruit. They think they followed all the laws and all the codes and all the yada, 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 right? And Jesus is like, your life hasn't been transformed. And how does he know that? Well, they wouldn't be upset with Jesus when he's healing someone on the Sabbath, right? Like you walk right by somebody who's sick on the Sabbath and you're like, oh, too bad, it's the Sabbath, can't heal you today. I'll come back tomorrow and take care of that, right? That's not how we live. Jesus says, look, I want you to abide in me. I want you to remain in me. I want you to be home at home in me. Because I want your life to be transformed. I want you to be a different person today than you were yesterday, than you were five years ago, than you were 10 years ago. I want you to be at home in me. Because the goal is to produce good fruit. The goal is for you and me to make a difference in our community. The goal for you and me is to build others up. I think the goal, and I started this with my sermon way back whenever we started this sermon series in September, and I talked about the fruit of the Spirit. Like, if we want to know how we are really doing, what sort of fruit we are bearing, I think Galatians 5.22 is where we look. Because it's hard to make a judgment on all of that like, it, 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 it's, it's hard to be even objective in that. But we look at Galatians 5.22. You've already heard it this morning. You remember that? Scott prayed it this morning. He did. You can go back and listen later on this if you're like, yeah, yeah, he, he prayed it. But Paul's writing to the church of Galatia. And he says this. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance. I always say patience. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. I want you to notice here the third word. Singular or plural? It is not fruits. Because if it's fruits, you and I would like to be, we would be like, hey, you know what? I'll take a little joy. I'll take a little love. I'll take a little forbearance. We're good to go. That's not what Paul says. Paul says the fruit all comes together. 
You don't get to pick and choose, by the way. Because some of us naturally, here's the deal. Like you look at those nine things, they're, they're, some of those are gonna come more naturally for us than other. But the Apostle Paul says, no, 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 no. This is a package deal. And so I ask myself, how am I doing with those nine ideas? Love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Because if I am abiding in Jesus, I need to be growing in those areas. The one lately I've been thinking a lot about is kindness. It was prompted by a podcast I was listening to. I don't remember exactly who it was. Well, I, this is the funny thing about podcasts. I went back to say, where was this guy? Where did he say this in his podcast? And it wasn't there. Because that's just what happens in sermons as well, I'm aware of. You all come up to me and tell me something that I said, and I'm like, I don't think I ever said that. But... Um, <laughs> But I was like, so this pastor, it doesn't matter who, it doesn't matter who it was. But anyway, he was talking, but the question was basically around, what's the ethos of your church? Like if someone showed up to your church, someone had been watching online and they show up to your church on Sunday morning, what are they going to find? And he said, they'll find Kindness. He said, what they're going to see and what they're going to hear is kindness. He said, people that are mean, people that are ugly, people that are kind of nasty, they're going to get here and realize they don't fit. Because we want to wrap one another in kindness. And that doesn't mean we're going to agree on everything, but it means when when we do disagree, we don't have to be angrily disagreeable, right? I'm I'm not foolish to think that much, but what I loved was I was like, that's part of what I love about this church as well. Blue, red, Fox, CNN, BBC, whatever it is, right? But we try to practice kindness. We try to be welcoming of one another. And I hope that you resonate with that. I hope that when you walk out on the courtyards, you're thinking, how can I extend kindness? And that's only one of the nine, but it's the one I've been thinking about, is how kind have I been? How kind am I being? Because when we abide in Jesus, the fruit is the fruit of the Spirit. And so I want to encourage us this week and in the upcoming weeks, as we continue to talk about being formed by our Savior, to make time to be at home with Jesus. That's how he forms us. That's where he forms us. And then he sends us out to make a difference in his name. Pray with me, please. God, for this day, we thank you. For this image that Jesus gives us that somewhat resonates with us of abiding, of remaining, but Lord, of making our home with you. And what a gift. You call us, you say, hey, come and spend time with me. Come and be changed by me. Lord, may we allow you to form within us the person you desire us to be. We ask in your son's name. Amen.